Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you guys for tuning in. Justin Stiver today filming uh, the, uh, the Stiver Show with a uh, buddy of mine, Andrew Legrand, founder, owner of Spare Law Group down in uh, New Orleans. What's going on, brother? Hey, happy to see you, Justin. It's good to be here. Um, Andrew, uh, I think this is, you know, I had reached out to him because I think this is a very timely conversation with everything going on, uh, coronavirus and all of that. Andrew um, has, a, has a law firm in New Orleans. I'll let him talk a little bit about what it is they do. But essentially, they're pretty uh, remote. And, and uh, I know he's got a team and everyone's kind of already working from home and, and all that. So he was really set up to, you know, weather this, weather this storm. And so I thought, you know, for I know a lot of people watching out there might be, uh, you know, lawyers, um, realtors, just other professionals who's, who have a uh, had their world rocked a little bit and not going into the office. And I thought, you know, Andrew, uh, you, could, you could provide some insight and some tips for, for how people can, can get through this. So glad to have you on, man. And, uh, you know, where I always start is, uh, who are you and what do you do? Yeah, so uh, I'm a, an attorney uh, here in New Orleans, graduated law school in 2011, been practicing what I call business law uh, for, I guess, close to nine years now. Um, we help business owners avoid stupid legal mistakes for a flat monthly fee. Um, so basically what that means is we, we talk to the client, figure out the size of their business, typically in terms of gross profit, um, and figure out we have tiers of service based upon how big they are, and we charge them flat fees to pretty much handle everything for them. Uh, you know, we get into some nuance there in terms of what's included and what's not included. But for the most part, the idea is we want them paying us a flat monthly fee, and we want them using our services. Uh, the biggest problem I saw as a young lawyer coming out was that uh, we were asked to solve a lot of problems for businesses that could have been easily fixed in the front end. Uh, and so from an entrepreneurial business standpoint, it was all these business owners are getting into problems that are complicated and expensive and hard to predict how much it's going to cost to fix. And the reason they were getting into those problems is that the legal marketplace was not offering them a, uh, a way to predict how much it would cost to prevent that kind of service, right? It was always break, fix. Um, and so we were moving in more into the proactive prevention spotting issues of side of things. Um, and so therefore, you know, our clients are paying us a monthly fee. They know how much they're paying us. So they're actually incentivized to call us and use the service and make sure they're getting value out of it rather than the opposite of the hourly rate and where they're disincentivized to call us and they can't budget for it and they don't know what to expect and that sort of thing. Awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, so that, that, I mean, that's basically it. We help our clients with all, all sorts of issues of running a business. Sometimes it's coaching, sometimes it's actual legal work. Uh, a lot of times it's in between. You know, they're, they're trying to accomplish something and it, sometimes it involves legal work, other times it involves, why don't you think about doing it this way? Yeah, well, and so I also meant to say, uh, before we dive in, is that you and I started growing our hair at about the same time and, and I caved and cut mine and you've still got yours going and it looks yeah, like- Yeah, we've got a little bit of a- You've got a little bit you know, in a deal right now, but yeah. Us, but uh, looking like a rock star over there. But, I'll leave uh, after the show. but so, so yeah, so you're working with, with small business owners. And so why, you know, I, what kind of made the decision? How did, how did you determine, you know, hourly fee sucks? People probably don't want to be charged based on every single phone call and email. Um, was that kind of you just saw from a business, from you being a business owner? Uh, business perspective that it just made more sense to do the flat fee arrangement? Uh, yeah, it was a lot of reasons. You know, a, a, for me, it means that we have, for, for me as a business owner, it means we have recurring revenue coming in so I can do a better job of predicting our revenue. Um, it, it also created a conundrum. We had a lot of clients who were contacting us and said, hey, here's the situation going on. I need advice about the situation. And sometimes the advice was really easy for them. You know, it was 20 minutes of advice from me could address your situation, right? So I had this issue of like, how do I charge you for 20 minutes worth of advice? In other words, the time that I was extending really wasn't commensurate with the value that I was providing. Um, so I had to figure out how to fix that issue as well. Uh, and sometimes I realized I was giving a lot, of the, a lot of that advice away for free in the sense like I'm not going to it's almost sometimes harder and more costly to send a bill for 20 minutes times an hourly rate than it is to just not bill you and just give that to you, yeah. uh, which is great. But, you know, I got bills to pay and I can't yeah. answer that question for 20 minutes if I'm not here to do that for you. Um, and, and also from the, from the client side too, again, we saw a lot of, a lot of clients come to us with problems. 
um, something that needs to be fixed and it's a mess and you look at it and, and you say, you know, why didn't you contact a lawyer? Um, they're like, well, I was scared of the cost. I didn't know how much it was going to be. Um, and scoping everything too, you know, uh, in the world, I say we do business law. That means everything from uh, estate planning to succession planning, to drafting contracts, to reviewing insurance, to um, and partner property to employment with advising on uh, uh, these new list packages laws that are out of stock. Uh, and if I had to put them a cost estimate every time somebody contacted me, I would spend half my day doing cost estimates. Um, so, you know, every, anytime somebody wants something, it's well, how much is that going to cost? Um, and so by, uh, by answering that question, by moving to monthly fees, it's I've kind of eliminated that issue uh, of how much it's going to cost, or at the very least, um, on some of our plans that are more a la carte, a lower monthly fee where you, you pay for additional services. Um, I'm getting now, I'm paid now to do the consultation, talk to you, figure out what you, you need and develop the proposal rather than just talk to everybody who wants to talk to me and develop a proposal and they find out, oh my God, it's going to cost money to actually do this legal thing. I don't want to pay that. Um, and so it eliminates those tire kickers and, and we're getting now paid to develop those scopes of work um, rather than not paid. Um, yeah. So I think it made a lot of sense for, uh, both the firm itself and, and for our clients. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love it. I, I love that business model. Um, and I was just cringing thinking about all the, you know, quote unquote free advice I've given over my, <laughs> over my career. Um, yeah. A uh, lot. But anyways, I don't want to, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, and, and sure. uh, I love the, I, I think the subscription model definitely makes sense. Um, certainly for your, for your, industry and, and the type of clients that you're that you're servicing because um, I would assume for a lot of these small business owners it might be difficult for them to you know come out of pocket you know a thousand two thousand three thousand dollars for a, maybe a one-time project but they do need right. that they do need that legal counselor or that business coach or someone that they can pick up a phone call and and just at, bounce a couple you know questions around and not be worried great, how much am I going to have to pay for this? And, and I would assume for a lot of those business owners, they're probably thinking, you know, this is, this is someone that I have on, on my team. Yeah, I mean, that, that's basically it. You know, it's, that kind of makes the relationship work a whole lot more. Now we're getting paid a reasonable fee to provide those answers to them. Uh, sometimes their questions are, yeah, I can't tell you how many times, uh, especially in the world of business, people want to do something and they, they're, they're coming to us thinking, oh, I'm going to pay this attorney to do X. Um, and we start talking to them about why they want to do X. And it turns out that doing X is a really bad idea. Uh, and so I don't, I don't know many other practice areas where people approach us and we actually talk them out of hiring us to do the thing they wanted to hire us to do. Yeah. So how to solve the problem of like the good advice, the best issue is partnership. Oh, I want to give 1% of my restaurant to my chef. Um, Okay, well that, that's a bad idea because that's a lot more complicated than, than you think it is. And maybe we should just incentivize the chef based upon, um, you know, the profitability of the restaurant or, or the food cost or something like that. Uh, you know, so now they would come to us expecting to pay for this ownership transaction and operating agreement where the advice became, why don't you just figure out what your average food costs are and create a KPI or create something to track there and give them a bonus based upon where that is on a certain scale. All right. So talked ourselves out of what they wanted us to do but needed to get money give, get paid for this advice that wasn't really there's no deliverable there right like i can't really i can help you come up with that but i'm not going to come up with the scale for that that kpi that bonus i can coach yeah. you through that but i can't do it yeah. um so that's another reason where we're charging that that monthly fee kind of came into play or, or just charging for the advice is um you know not many people that are family yeah I think that's, I think that's great. Well, let's shift a little bit, um, you know, cause I know that you've got a team and, and you're working out of the house uh, and all that. So tell us a little bit about that. You know, was the decision to, to make it virtual intentional? Was it, you know, I'm starting out a business and I just don't have the money to pay for an office. And then I turned out, you know, I like it now or what was, which makes sense. I, what, what was, what was that decision? Uh, probably a little bit of both, to be honest. Um, you know, like a lot of law students, I, uh, I, I clerked uh, in law school. And uh, here's one of my co-workers, my girlfriend, had an to work for the day. Uh, see you later. Bye. Um, 
you know, like a lot of young lawyers, I clerked uh, at different law firms in law school and realized that I was, you know, every day I would, I would wake up in the morning, I would make lunch, I would get dressed, I would spend 30 minutes commuting into the office. You know, I was wasting an, not wasting an hour, hour and a half each day going to sit at a desk at a computer to do things that I could do perfectly fine from home. And there were a lot of days where I would never really talk to anyone else, you know? Um, so I realized there was this kind of like inefficient use of my, of my personal time of, of going to work at this spot where I could have worked from home. Um, so, so that was kind of like an inefficiency that I saw there uh, and something that I wanted to work on. Um, so that was kind of like the, there's a problem. Let me try to fix that problem. The second part was kind of what you said. It was a young lawyer. Uh, I started out the law firm right after graduating from law school in 2011. We're still dealing with the financial crisis of 08. And um, I started my law firm from my mom's kitchen table. And so it started there. And so it was kind of remote help was needed at first. Uh, so kind of a combination of those two things. Uh, and eventually it became a and even showing itself right now is I, I like working from home. I don't like having to in person. Um, I like being more fluid in my day. Um, so I think both those things kind of helped. Um, although now we do have an office on Canal Street uh, in New Orleans. We have had one for years. You know, I, I know I need to have that spot to meet clients. So I'd say our model is more of, uh, I have three people, three other people on the team. So there's four of us total. We are all within a 15, 20 minute drive of one another. So I hire local. Um, so I'm basically kind of combining the, the best of both worlds of, of, yes, we need an office. Yes, we need to meet people in person. Yes, we need to come together as a team on a regular basis to see each other. But no, that does not mean that everyone has to drive into the same location every day at some certain set of time just to get work done from this particular location. So I'm trying to now blend those two. Well, I think two, two parts of what you said, um, I could hear pushback from other attorneys. Uh, and the first being, my clients have, I have to meet my clients in person, or I have to meet my people in, you know, I have to meet the prospective clients or the existing client in person. Or number two is, well, I have to have, I have to have a, my team uh, in a space so I know that they're working so that we are team building, et cetera. And to that second point, I think everybody's going to probably disagree with that after the end of this coronavirus, and they'll see that people can very well work uh, remotely. And, and actually, you know, I've been monitoring my team, and they're being much more efficient <laughs> from home than they are at the office. Um, and to the first to the first point, you know, I I've always been pretty. I only do telephonic consultations, anyways, and that's just kind of the nature of my business because I get a lot of out of state referrals or what whatnot. So they're not local anyways. Um, so I always push back when, when attorneys tell me, oh, well, we couldn't because our, our, ours is different. We got to meet with our clients in person. And, you know, maybe, maybe not. But what I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, it, it kind of depends on, on the client, first of all. Um, you know, for our kind of lower end clients, you know, the, the very small businesses that are under a half million dollars a year or more in revenue, sometimes the phone or, or video conference is just fine for them. You know, they're not terribly sophisticated for the businesses that are, uh, you know, in the seven figures a year. Uh, sometimes it helps, especially in the sales process, the need to meet with them in person to show them that they were real, real, we are a real law firm and we have that kind of facility to, to help them. Um, so, you know, it's finding the balance between those two things. Again, I think it goes to like the, also the complexity of the clients. You know, uh, if you're doing a lot of uh, work representing the indigent, indigent and, and poor folks, it might be harder for them to have the technology to do it. Whereas for our clients, a lot of them are okay with, with meeting in person. Um, so we balance those. We offer our clients those options. And I have found that when I'm trying to sell a client that's a multi-million dollar business, um, yeah, I need to go meet with that person in person. And it helps for them to come into the office. Um, and I also have a vision of growing our firm into something where we're, we're having clients come into the office for like monthly group meetings, right? So, so taking yeah. that membership model and adding value to that um, beyond an hourly rate, bringing them in and talking about different topics. So we need to have that office. Uh, so basically it's like combining the professionalism of, of an office without having everyone there. And then to your point about employees, you know, if you can't trust your employees to work remotely, they, they probably shouldn't be your employee anyway, to be quite honest. Um, you know, I've seen that objection a few times. Well, how do I know that they're working? 
well, you need, you need to be tracking what results are actually getting done. What's happening? You know, or are you giving them uh, tasks? Is there, is there a task list with, with specific tasks that you want and deadlines and maybe an ideal amount of time? Or, and are they getting the work done or are they not? If they're not getting the work done, then yeah, you've got a problem. But if they're getting the work done, then what does it matter, you know, how, how they're being inefficient or not? Um, you know, my guess is that my employees probably spend a lot less time on social media and bullshit when they're at home because the only reason people do that at work is because they're bored at work right? right. and they don't want right. to be there. So they want to be somewhere else. Whereas um, when they're working from home, okay, well, yeah, they want to get the work done and want to move on to something more important. Uh, I've also seen too that, uh, you know, I mentioned that for me, it was a problem of getting ready to get up and get dressed and spend that hour commuting every day. I absolutely think, especially with folks of our generation that are, you know, 40, for mid 40s and younger right now, and, and the generation below that, especially this generation that's going through college and, and high school uh, with a whole semester remotely, is you're going to see that uh, offering people remote work is a good way to, it's an employee benefit. Um, I didn't think of that at, as it was at first. Um, but, you know, if you just do some simple math, if you say that commuting to an office for the vast majority of people, at least an hour a day, um, you know, you multiply that by uh, 240 days a year. That's 240 hours of time, of personal time, that I can now give back to my employees uh, as a benefit. Um, so I actually have a lower cost of hiring those people because I've, I've found that I can offer a little bit lower wages because I'm not asking them to commute in every day. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a, a benefit to the business. Yeah, I, uh, it's interesting. I mean, my, my staff, I think, is... is becoming accustomed to this working from home thing. And I am toying with it because it saves me office space. It saves me parking. It saves me uh, a bunch of other stuff. Right. I think it, it very well could be a way to incentivize people, um, you know, to not, maybe not just balance it out as an added bonus. You know, you don't have to come into right. the office every day, but it sounds like, and I, I would probably agree with you that there is, there are going to be clients who you need to meet in person. And there might be just a reason why you need an office space to come in. Um, so maybe there's some sort of hybrid, uh, you know, situation where maybe you work from home, but you do a shared space type situation that has a, you know, a conference room that you can use when you need or something like that. Are right. there? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say it kind of depends on what, what feeling you're going for. You know, with, with my business clients, I, I need to compete with the big regional law firms and they have these big, nice professional offices. So I do feel like I, you know, I don't know if a shared space would be, it's not the next step for me. We need our own personal space and a spot where they can come in and meet with us. Um, whereas maybe if you're doing more, um, you know, like not your type of work, but the fact that you're dealing with a lot of people out of state, maybe the shared conference room makes more sense for somebody like you where in a consumer practice, people might not be as concerned with the frills of the right. business or, or need to be impressed as much. So it kind of depends too on like what your client sure. avatar is and what they would expect. Yeah, very true. Well, so to give, you know, I know we're running up against the clock, but to give a couple, you know, a couple, I guess just pointers or you can go any way you want, any software. I know you're, you're big into to tech and leveraging tech as much as possible as well for, I think you are, right? I don't, I th yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, sure. I think you're, all right. Um, is there anything, you know, you would maybe recommend for some of these law firms or just, you know, professionals in general that, you know, must have, got to use, simplifies your life, test sort of thing? Yeah, but my, my biggest recommendation for software is people are always looking for this kind of magic bullet. And you see this on a lot of the lawyer forums that we're both on. They say, what do y'all think about this software versus this right. software? And I do this a lot with my business clients too. I say, software is just a tool to do a job. And so whenever I get in depth with somebody talking about software, I say, what problem are you actually trying to solve? Rather than just blanket recommending software, yeah. let's figure out what business problem or issue that you're actually having, identify that, and then figure out the software that actually solves that. Um, because I can, I can tell you like what's in our tech stack and what we do, but I've actually stopped doing that because we're using software to fix specific business problems that we have. Yeah. Um, and so I've analyzed it from that perspective. Um, so I, I would tell folks that is to actually that the best thing you can do is not go sit there and say, oh, I heard a lot about Clio or my case or this or that or whatever it might be, but sit back and say, okay, what problems, what, what am I doing in my workflow? What do I need to solve? And what do I need to get done? 
um, because if you're not doing that, you could go buy a big expensive piece of software that doesn't actually solve any problems for you. Um, or the opposite is you might only have, your problem might be very easy and simple to solve and you could buy something that's you know, a shotgun to kill a fly. Um, you, you could be paying a lot more for something that you don't really need all the features that it provides to do this one thing that you're looking for. So that, that's kind of my best tech advice is figure out what problems and features you actually need. Um, the second thing is uh, we've been remote first in, in our law firm. Um, and so whenever I'm trying to solve those problems, I think about having to do that remotely before I think about how I would do it in person. Um, so kind of just like a, a few simple examples is like, let's say that we need to mail a check to somebody, right? Like we, we're, we're paying a vendor and a lot of times we can pay with a credit card. Um, but let's say that we need, need to mail a check to somebody. From a procedure standpoint, in a physical office space, physical first would be go to the check drawer, open the checkbook, put the check in the printer, um, you know, and do go to the mail and put it in the mail and do this, that, and the other. Well, that doesn't really work in a remote first spot because I don't want to go to the office every single time I have to do a check. So our remote first way of doing it is saying we just use Chase Quick Pay um, or, or Chase Bill Pay to mail checks. Um, so think about as a remote workforce the idea of think about solving the problem first from a remote perspective um and then and then figure out what that problem is and then look at the tools to do it um, another common example is getting clients to sign engagement letters um you know we uh we use a lot of different engagement letters based upon what what service the client wants and, and what what they what they want to engage us in um and I mean, we've been using e-signature engagement letters for a long time. Um, and we've actually gotten to the point now where we're using more like terms of service. Like people actually aren't physically signing our engagement letters anymore. They're, they're just clicking accept. Um, and, and we get a notification that they're doing that. And um, we haven't noticed an issue with that. Um, but you know, now we've built it out to where instead of having, you know, well, you got this piece of paper that's in this drawer. When the client comes in, you take out the piece of paper and you write in a couple things and then you put it in front of them and then sign and then you stick it in the folder. That's a, a physical workspace first process. Whereas the remote workplace is, okay, they've entered their name and their contact information. Now we need to take that information and somehow put it into our uh, proposal software and get it there, modify the proposal and then send it out to them via email. Um, you know, so that, that would be the, the other piece of advice is think about, how do I address these things from a remote first um, perspective? What problems do I have? And how do I solve them regardless of where I am? Uh, and if you can do that, you, you'll start to depend less on the physical location. And now the physical location becomes less of a, of a ball and chain that you're tied to. Like, oh, I have to go to the office to get this thing done. Becomes, I can get this done from wherever I am and I can go to the office when I need to. Uh, and so that kind of combining of the two things seems I don't know. I, I enjoy it. I prefer, I think, after this whole COVID thing, a lot of businesses are going to be going that way where they're thinking about remote first and only going to the office when they need to. And again, I think the whole uh, generation, people in their 30s and their 20s that are going to spend, you know, six months this year working from home, I think people are going to start to expect that more and they're going to see that they actually, I personally like it a lot more. So I, I suspect that other people like it a lot more. Yeah. Too. No, I think that's, I think that's great advice. And I think it's very easy to, um, to get, <clears throat> caught up in these do you like this software do you like this software you know and it's like they all they all can be good um but it's easy to you know sign up for all these things and then you realize wait how much am i paying in all these subscriptions like right. <laughs> every month um so I, I love the approach of figure out what you know don't go to the software just because it's popular right now but figure out what your actual need is and maybe look at the software that you're already paying for first and see if that can actually you know cover the, the problem that you have or fix the problem, um, you know, that you have. And the remote first idea, that's, I like that. I don't know if you came up with that phrase or not, but I like that think rem remote first, um, just for myself kind of thinking about, you know, and, and actually your, your issue with checks. We write so many freaking checks that I gotta, I gotta update how we're doing that. Cause it's not, it's not efficient right now. Um, yeah. It's a perfect example, right? I think it was actually, uh, I want to say I got it from the folks who started Basecamp. Uh, software, which was like yeah. early project yeah. management software. It's it's not as popular, I think, as it once was yeah, 10 years ago or so. I remember it as like a message or like, a, yeah, I remember it from, from something. But. Yeah, but they were, they were an early remote workforce. Um, and that was, uh, they had a book about that. And that was kind of like 
one of the pivotal topics I took away from it is, is think about your processes and how somebody does them remotely first. Yeah. Um, you know, so all our all, all our processes now are start out with like how you mail a check, how you mail a letter, how you do things from home, how you how how do you dial out on the office line from your cell phone, mm -hmm. right? How do you hide your cell phone number when you're not actually in a physical office? So all those processes have started. How do you do a remote first? And that actually becomes kind of easy to figure out. Well, how when you need to go to the office, how do you do it? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's just a lot of different, but that comes into play in a lot of different situations when you really start thinking about it. Um, it's just a different way of, of trying to solve problems. Yeah, I like it. Well, Andrew, appreciate it, brother. Um, how can um, how can people find you, get in contact with you, all that good stuff? Uh, the best way to stay in touch is probably to uh, sign up to our, our newsletter. Uh, we send out a, a fun monthly newsletter. It's just a digital thing. We get a lot of compliments on it. Um, Sparelaw.com slash newsletter. Uh, you can enter your email there, or you can go to fairlaw.com, and all our contact information is up there. Uh, more on all the social medias and that sort of thing, too. But uh, if there's anything, it's maybe the newsletter. We try to put a personal touch to that once a month. Um, right now, it's a whole lot of COVID stuff, and it's way more often than once a month. But uh, in normal times, it's, it's a little bit more fun and light. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's where we are today. Well, awesome, brother. I appreciate your time, man. Uh, thank you for uh, for coming on, and thank you, guys. And uh, Stay safe out there. Stay healthy. And we'll see you guys soon. Thanks, man. Yeah, same to you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Justin.